hit noon. Um, Sarah and Sierra, I just made y'all co-host as well. Um, just want to make have multiple folks on, but let's go ahead and get started. And I know folks will be joining us um, at the noon hour, a little bit afterwards. But thank you first for everyone um, that's on today for joining us for Montana Institute on Ecosystems Rough Cut Seminar Series. Uh, just as a quick note, this is our final Rough Cut Seminar of the fall semester. Um, so spring 2021, a new schedule and lineup will be sent out um, in December, early January. But just a note that, yeah, we're really happy to have everyone on today for um, our final one of the fall. So a few housekeeping items before we jump into introductions and then presentations. Um, First, you'll notice that you have been muted upon entry into the seminar and just want to remind folks that um, to keep your mics muted throughout just so we don't have any noise interference. Um, you can also, since we do have quite a few folks joining us, um, make sure that your videos are turned off just to help with um, bandwidth capacity. So just a quick note um, to help make sure we don't have any technical snafus throughout. Um, another housekeeping item just related to Q&A is that we will hold all questions until all of our presenters have finished speaking. So all questions will take place at the very end. Um, and then the final thing is that we are recording today's seminar and it will be available on the Institute on Ecosystems website. And I will make sure at the end to repeat where you can find that, um, find the video, try to get them posted by the end of today. And I'll put the link as well to the actual web page where that will be found um, in the chat function. So with those housekeeping items, I'm going to go ahead and hand it over um, to our co-hosts today, Sarah Bates and Sierra Harris. And I'm going to stop my video. And yeah, we'll go ahead and get started. Well, thank you, Madison. This is Sarah Bates. I'm with the National Wildlife Federation. joined by Sierra Harris oh, with yes. the Nature Conservancy. And we both, we're kind of the bookend uh, co-hosts of this uh, program. So I'm gonna just introduce the topic and then we'll go right to our speakers because they're really the feature for today. Um, so today's seminar is aimed at highlighting the valuable partnerships that are underway between Montana University researchers and natural resource agencies and conservation groups that are working uh, with the beaver uh, in cooperation with beavers for riparian and watershed health in Montana. And as most of you know, I'm sure beavers are a hot topic, not just in Montana, but throughout the country, uh, with a lot of interest in the roles that they play in shaping their environment and building ecosystem resilience. There's such a hot topic. There's so much interest that we have in Montana, a beaver working group. Uh, which is open to all who share an interest in restoring beavers and beaver habitat. This group has gathered several times over the years, most recently early this past year in 2020. Um, and the group agreed that the number one priority is to build support for integrating uh, beavers into stream restoration throughout the state. And part of our conversation with this group highlighted the need to address persistent questions and concerns uh, that arise when we talk about beaver restoration, which is exactly why we depend on the good work of the Montana University System researchers that we're highlighting today. Before we move to that focus, I think it's useful to clarify what we mean when we say beaver restoration. Uh, beaver restoration can include a wide range of actions that are aimed at restoring ecological functions. They're not just focused on the animal itself. Uh, today's speakers, for example, are going to focus on the uh, impacts and questions that arise around beaver mimicry. In other words, installing human built structures to imitate beaver dams, to reconnect floodplains, expand riparian habitat, and make it possible for beavers to return to areas that aren't currently very welcoming to them. In our efforts to promote and pursue beaver restoration, uh, we've focused on various obstacles uh, that arise. And these questions are really necessary to be answered if we're going to build acceptance for beavers on the landscape. So we are in our various organizations conservation work addressing every one of these key issues in different parts of our programs. 
Uh, but for each one, we, we really do need the help of researchers to answer these questions. And that's why uh, the questions that are being addressed today will help illustrate how interconnected research, conservation, and management really are. I'll mention in passing that there's one more essential component that we're not really addressing today, and that's focused on building awareness and even excitement among the next generation of conservation stewards. Uh, we're engaged in lots of efforts to in involve young people and their families in learning about beavers, including citizen science initiatives to uh, take a look at beaver habitats. Uh, that's an active program in Western Montana. We found that beavers are interesting. People get excited when they hear about them and they're moved to action when they learn about how important beavers are to our environment. So let me introduce our speakers for today. Uh, they're focused on some of the key issues that I mentioned a few minutes ago, and they're, uh, they're good demonstrations of how well we can cooperate between the university and the applied uh, management and conservation world. We'll first hear from Dr. Jamie McAvoy from um, Montana State University. She's gonna talk about the people side of the equation, the social and institutional factors that influence acceptance of beaver mimicry. Uh, well, second, we'll hear from Andy Bost from Montana Bureau of Mines, um, and he'll have a water focus in his presentation. And he'll talk about how his work is kind of ground truthing the claims that beaver mimicry results in improved water storage and late season flows. And finally, we'll hear from Andrew Lahr from the University of Montana Wildlife Biology Program, where he works with Dr. Lisa Eby, answering questions about the interaction of beaver dams and fish, and his work is focused in Western Montana. After that, after we hear from each of the participants, we'll uh, hear a wrap up from Sierra Harris from the Nature Conservancy, and then we'll move to questions and discussion. So I'm going to turn this over now to Jamie. Stop sharing my screen. Great, hopefully you're seeing my screen now. Um, and yeah, as, thank you, Sarah. And as Sarah mentioned, uh, I'm a social scientist. And so my research focuses on the people part. Uh, and I've had a couple of projects with students um, and I will really wanna highlight here, Danica Holmes, who's now with uh, the Montana Department of Natural Resources and Conservation in the Water Rights Bureau. Uh, she finished her master's in 2016. And also Megan Moore, whose work I'll be highlighting. Uh, she finished her master's in 2018 here, and she's now a PhD student um, in Missoula. And so my these projects have focused on aspects of um, permitting and also public perception. Let me navigate to this screen. Um, so I think of a slightly broader umbrella than just beaver mimicry, but this bigger picture of natural water storage, uh, which includes actions that help to slow water and uh, encourage infiltration into aquifers. And this is highlighted in the 2015 state water plan um, and a need for increased water storage and retention as a way of responding to climate change. Um, but what shape, what form is that storage going to take? And the plan actually highlights uh, exploring the use of green infrastructure, so that would certainly include beaver mimicry structures, uh, to store and retain water. Uh, so on the permitting end, um, one question that comes up within uh, regulating agencies themselves, but also for landowners, is will this project require uh, a water right? And the answer is it depends. And my understanding is it's still very much in discussion, kind of um, coming to a final answer on this, but it, it, it really depends on the size of the project. So on the left is a small scale um, restoration project on, on Norwegian Creek in Madison Valley, Montana. And the other is a uh, larger scale project in on Long Creek in Centennial Valley. And, the question that comes up is, um, you know, is it simply restoration or is there any appropriation happening, meaning um, taking water and, and potentially affecting downstream users in an adverse way? Um, and also, is that water being put to a beneficial use? So in 2016, the state uh, water rights agency, the DNRC, uh, issued a 
a document that provides some guidance for landowners and practitioners working on stream and wetland restoration that basically says if the project approximates the natural characteristics of adjacent wetlands and if it pools or ponds less than 30,000 gallons of water, it would not, the project would not require a water right. Um, structure should be deformable and permeable um, as, as um, Andrew Lair will be talking about the importance of that. Um, but, but in some, the kind of bottom line is that projects should be evaluated on a case by case basis in consultation with um, the Department of Natural Resources and Conservation. Um, other permits may be required, and I'm going to turn shortly to uh, Megan's research and interviews with landowners in the Red Rock watershed and some of their um, perceptions of this permitting issue, but sometimes a 310 permit is required and a 310 permit is meant to um, assure that that impacts to water quality, um, erosion, turbidity are minimized. Um, and so from Megan's work, um, just a couple of quotes here. Um, as one interviewee said, if it's a, just a 310 permit, that's not too unreasonable. Whereas another person felt that, you know, these permits, geez, you just look at the river and you've got to get a permit indicating, you know, some, some frustration or um, concerns about the permitting process. So one last note, just on the sort of policy end, I want to point to a really interesting bill that came out uh, in California in 2016 as a way to provide financing for restoration. So this bill um, classified watersheds as a form of infrastructure, or at least made watersheds eligible for the same forms of financing as other water collection and treatment infrastructure. Uh, and I just think that's a really interesting uh, way to, to bring funding potentially to these type of projects. So moving now towards public perception, um, I'll turn to Megan Moore's work uh, where she interviewed um, ranchers in the Red Rock watershed in southwestern Montana in the upper Beaverhead um, watershed. And following established typologies in landowner literature, um, distinguishing differences between traditional ranchers who basically um, are full-time ranchers and the majority of their income is generated from the operation. Um, as a, being sort of a different type or set of, of ranchers than amenity ranchers who acquire ranches for recreational benefits, um, often hire a, a ranch manager to handle the agricultural production side of the ranch um, and, and may not rely or do not rely on the ranch as a major source of income. And so when she, when she analyzed her interviews, she saw some differences kind of um, between these two groups or, or types of ranchers. And so in general, the traditional ranchers, well, first I should say many of the ranchers were not familiar with beaver mimicry projects before the interview. And she had some images and sort of explained uh, what the structure was and then asked um, their, their thoughts on diff different aspects of the project. Uh, traditional ranchers tended to be less interested in beaver mimicry projects on their property. And if they were interested, they noted uh, the need for incentives such as cost sharing or grant programs um, to implement the projects. Uh, the two ranchers have different priorities. Of course, traditional ranchers focused on um, production um, as their source of income, while amenity ranchers are perhaps more interested in some of the wildlife um, pri priorities and managing for wildlife on their property. Um, the two types have different access to resources. Um, amenity ranchers tend to have more um, money to, to invest in restoration projects. And her interviews showed um, different relationships with government entities. So amenity ranchers generally seem to think they had good relationships with government entities and perhaps better relationships than um, traditional ranchers have with, with government entities. Although half of her interviewees felt that they had good relationships um, with, with both government and non-government entities. Um, so I'll go over a couple of barriers, and the first being that of skepticism um, about beaver mimicry projects. And as one rancher said, you know, I can't believe that 
that that would do much good. Beaver mimicry projects wouldn't store enough water. Uh, it's just kind of a fantasy. So Andy Bopp's research hopefully will um, shed some light onto this, how much water is actually being stored. Um, another rancher mentioned um, that, that from an operational standpoint, beaver mimicry just didn't make sense, even if it made sense from an environmental standpoint. Um, that's my reminder, so I'll wrap up here shortly. Um, other ranchers, more than half the ranchers interviewed cited cost and permitting as big biggest as their biggest barriers. Um, I mentioned the 310 permit, but also in terms of water rights, um, interviewees emphasized that they themselves would not want to interfere with their neighbor's water rights. Um, they felt their neighbors were free to implement these practices as long as it didn't affect their own water rights. Um, but one interviewee did did express concern that their neighbor sort of saw anything being done as a as a potential negative impact on water and and was worried that uh, um, starting a practice like this might raise or spark concerns with their neighbor. Uh, and then in terms of their general attitudes about beaver, some spoke of letting beaver on their property in the right places and others spoke of their dislike uh, of beaver saying, honestly, if beavers build in the wrong spot, they're kind of a pest. So in terms of opportunities, uh, interviewees noted the importance of good partnerships that are marked by flexibility, trust, and interacting with someone local in the region. And half the interviewees recommended the Natural Resources Conservation Service as the entity that they would most prefer to work with or receive technical assistance from. Um, and the, Majority of ranchers recommended fi financial help specific through, specifically through grants or cost share programs as the main incentives that could be used. Um, incentives such as technical assistance, adding uh, value to the land or having trained crews to help them were only mentioned uh, a handful of times. And so my last slide here, I just want to note that there will hopefully soon be a forthcoming paper. Uh, Megan and I are working with um, Tori Paffel and Amanda Cravens with the USGS Social Science Branch in Fort Collins. And we're combining Megan's uh, interview, interviews with ranchers with a set of interviews uh, that were conducted out of the USGS office and looking at the salient, saliency, credibility, and legitimacy of beaver mimicry information and how that um, affects the uptake and action, actionable um, movement towards actionable science. So with that, I will turn it over to Andy. All right, thanks, Jamie. Um, so what I'm going to focus on today is kind of the question of will uh, implementing beaver mimicry stream restoration increase dry season water availability. And so in particular today, I'm just gonna talk about groundwater levels and stream flows. And, and our approach to uh, looking at this was to first develop some simple uh, models of mountain headwater streams using mod flow to monitor treatments at two sites on Long Creek and Alkali Creek using before after control treatment study design and then we plan to develop models for those sites to mechanistically understand why we're seeing what we're seeing. And I haven't done that yet, so we won't talk, talk about it today. But in general, when we begin to think about water availability, a good place to start is a water budget of some sort. And so in this case, we're talking about taking uh, beaver mimicry structures, placing them on the stream, and that causing an increase in the surface water flowing into the aquifer during high flows. That water can then be stored in the aquifer uh, until the late summer, and then it can flow back out to the stream. So there's a few complexities here uh, once you set this up. The first is that uh, once you increase the storage in the aquifer, increase the groundwater levels, you're going to also see an increase in evapotranspiration and groundwater outflow. The other part is that the timing here is really important, that we can't just think about this in a steady state sense, but the timing really matters. And so we need to think about it in terms of seasonally dynamic storage, that how do we get the water to come out when and where we really want it to. 
and so looking at those simple groundwater models that I developed, we're looking at a baseline and then five different levels of treatment using different BMR strategies on gaining, losing, and strongly losing streams. And I'll start by just looking at the groundwater level changes that we uh, modeled looking at the losing setting. So by placing that beaver mimicry structure on the stream, we see the groundwater levels increased by up to about 15 centimeters above that structure. If in addition to that, we add a seasonally active side channel that would be flowing water during high flows, we end up seeing that by the time we get to the late summer, the groundwater mounding is very similar to what we saw from the structure alone because the mound created by the additional inundation has largely dissipated by the time we get to the late summer. Uh, so then, not surprisingly, if we add uh, a faraway channel or several channels to imitate floodplain inundation or a far channel inundation, those also show effects that are very similar to the structure alone because of the dissipation of the groundwater mound. Alternatively, if we put an off-channel pond in place that continues to recharge groundwater throughout the uh, dry season, we see that when we're in late August, we get much larger increases in the groundwater elevation relative to uh, pre-treatment, seeing here over 45 centimeters of increase. Uh, switching from groundwater levels to stream flows, we can look at the net uh, gain in the stream going across the model reach. And uh, we see again that the effects from the structure itself and the different uh, side channel inundation scenarios are all very similar to one another. Again, the off channel pond has a much greater effect. Also notably here, we see that in the strongly losing setting, we uh, actually caused there to be more of a loss from the stream than there was prior to treatment. And that's because we're increasing the stage of the stream, increasing that gradient, pushing more of the stream water year round into the underlying aquifer. And in the strongly losing setting, that water can't make its way back to the stream, or at least not within the model domain. That water does not cease to exist. It just leaves the model domain as groundwater outflow rather than as stream flow. Uh, and so just to put this in a context that maybe is a little more uh, intuitive, that we're looking at a single structure uh, showing an increase of between basically no change and about four gallons per minute increase in flow. So we can switch now from looking at models to looking at our monitoring. And I'm going to focus today on just the Alkali Creek site uh, so this is the treatment reach for the Alkali Creek with the black crosses showing the six uh, beaver mimicry structures that were installed at that site. And if we look at a, a hydrograph from one of the pisometers out there, we can see that the groundwater levels in the late summer were much lower uh, prior to treatment. So in the 2016 time period uh, than they were post treatment. And the amplitude of that annual signal is also significantly less pronounced. Uh, and so here we're looking at a change of about a 60 centimeter increase in groundwater levels in the late summer. Uh, we can also look at the area that is, uh, or that shows a 30 centimeter or greater increase in groundwater elevations. And so in the first year following the treatment, the 2017 versus 2016, we can see this area largely near the stream in 2018 that expanded out to cover most of the alluvial floodplain. Um, and in 2019, it's actually quite similar to 2018, except for on the downstream end of the reach where we see this strange loop-de-loop uh, -loop -loop occurring. And what's going on there is there was erosion of the beaver mimicry structures on that end. So the stream stage ended up dropping down in that area. Uh, so that's groundwater levels and now switching to stream flows, we can look at the change in stream flow along this reach. Uh, so just differential stream gauging. And if we uh, plot that relative to the discharge at the upstream station, we can see some fairly interesting patterns where we've got the 2016 in orange showing that most of this reach uh, or that the reaches 
losing during most of this time period prior to treatment. 2017 looks very similar to 2016, even though you know the beaver mimicry restoration has occurred. But then 2018 shows a completely different pattern with much more gain occurring during that time period. And then 2019 shows a more neutral uh, system. But 2018 was very wet in this area, so I expect that that's largely because of uh, soil water coming into the system throughout the summer uh, during 2018. But we do see this shift uh, in 2019 from what we were looking at prior to treatment. However, when we zoom in on this low flow period, that's probably the area that we're most interested in, it would be really hard to say that there's a significant change in the uh, net stream gain along this reach during those low flow periods, which is really quite consistent with the uh, modeling that we saw where you wouldn't expect to be able to see, you know, a few gallons per minute increase uh, through differential stream flow gauging. Uh, but what we can do uh, is to look at the differences in the gradients between the stream and the underlying groundwater. So here we have the groundwater levels uh, in red and the stream elevations in blue. And by looking at when the treatment occurred, we can uh, see the difference that occurs here where prior to treatment, this reach was, or this location was strongly losing during most of the dry season. Uh, and then each year it became somewhat less losing until in 2019, we see that it completely shifted to being gaining during the entire year. Uh, so again, that's consistent with the idea that we're shifting from a losing stream to a gaining stream, even if we can't uh, see that through the direct differential stream flow measurements. And so in conclusion, concerning water, groundwater levels, we see that both modeling and monitoring indicates the groundwater levels increase following BMR treatment. Uh, the magnitude and geographic extent of those are going to be highly variable depending on how many structures you build, how big you build them, and what the aquifer properties are at those sites. Um, also, because the groundwater level increases will cause evapotranspiration and groundwater outflow to also increase, um, we shouldn't expect to see all of the water that went into the aquifer during high flows to come back out during low flows. Uh, if we shift to looking at stream flows, again, the modeling suggested zero to four gallon per minute of increase from a single structure. When we looked at Alkali Creek with six structures, we couldn't uh, quantify that using differential gauging, uh, but we did see that shift uh, from losing to gaining conditions. And so that's what I've got for today, and I'll turn it over to Andrew. Thank you, Andy. So, I think it's trying to share here, okay. So, <clears throat> as we've looked at the li existing literature um, as it pertains to beavers and beaver dam analogs and their effect on trout and trout habitat, three major um, knowledge gaps have kind of come to our attention. Um, those being that the restoration potential of beaver dam analogs um, as they pertain to trout um, especially in streams uh, without beaver and headwaters, um, is largely unknown. Um, we also don't have a strong understanding of how beaver dams and beaver dam analogs affect connectivity as it pertains to trout movement um, within the context of the Rocky Mountain West. And lastly, um, the interaction of beaver-mediated habitat and non-native species occup occupancy, in particular brook trout, um, uh, because brook trout are uh, uh, well known to proliferate in habitats similar to those created by beaver um, is not understood either. And so today I'm going to be <clears throat> presenting some questions that I'm trying to answer in the form of my dissertation that seek to resolve some of these knowledge gaps. Um, and then I'm also going to present some uh, preliminary data for some of my field efforts in answering those questions. So my first question is how do BDAs alter fish habitat and fish populations over time? So in partnership with the Lolo National Forest, the Clark Fork Coalition, and the Nature Conservancy, I've set up a multi-year before-after control impact study on three different pairs of streams on the Lolo National Forest. Uh, each pair consists of a control stream and a stream where we've put between 9 and 14 beaver dam analogs. 
And in each of those streams, we're measuring changes in fish habitat and incumbent changes to fish population from before to after restoration. And then we're comparing those changes across treatments. And so we put these, we, we spent a, a summer out in 2019 collecting this data. The BDAs went in in fall 2019. And then we worked this summer to collect some after data. And we hope to do a few more years of after data as well. So today I'm just going to present a snapshot of what we've seen so far. Here I have an aerial image of the upstream end of TP Creek, which is a um, tributary to Howard Creek, which is then a tributary to Lolo Creek. Um, TP prior to restoration was characterized as having a very incised, narrow channel, um, very simplified habitat, not a lot of pools. Um, um, but you can see here, we put in some beaver dam analogs. These are two of our most upstream beaver dam analogs circled in red, um, but there were 12 more downstream. And after restoration, we saw immediate pooling of water behind those impoundments, which we'd expect. But with that, uh, over the course of this past summer, we saw uh, increased overbank uh, uh, flooding and increased presence of side channels and overall increase in hab habitat heterogeneity in this previously uh, simplified stream. And so, uh, in result of that increase in heterogeneity, we measured some changes in hydrology and temperature. So in order to detect changes in hydrology, we had two discharge stations, one at the downstream end and one at the upstream end of each site, um, labeled here in yellow. And we noticed at TP Creek that it was a gaining reach both before and after the restoration. Flow out was always higher than flow coming in. However, after restoration, we saw that downstream base flow discharges late into the summer um, were 1.5 times higher in TP Creek than they were previously. And we did not see the same change in the control. And this indicates to us that we're increasing the residence time of that water during the late season, such that base flows are now higher. We're keeping more water in the stream for longer, which is great. Um, as far as temperature goes, um, we saw that because of that increase in pool habitat, that increase in habitat heterogeneity, there was an increase in longitudinal temp, uh, thermal heterogeneity across the length of our stream. Um, so average daily temperatures varied more um, after restoration than they did prior. And we did not see an equal amount of change in this uh, metric in our control stream in this uh, drainage. So like I said, this is just a snapshot. This is all I, I can share today on this project. I have two other pairs of streams and lots more summers of work to go, so stay tuned. Um, I have plenty to share in the coming months and years. But now I'm going to move on to my next question. Um, do trout pass beaver dams? And more specifically, are there characteristics of dams that um, determine if they pass fish or not? Um, and so in order to answer this question, we set out on West Fork Lolo Creek, a two kilometer section of this creek this past summer, this past July, in fact. Um, this is just upstream of Lee Creek Campground on Highway 12, if you're familiar. Um, this reaches home to between eight and 10 beaver dams, depending on the time of year. Um, and we were able to tag about 600 fish here, brook trout and cutthroat. And then we, on a monthly basis after that, we tracked the movement of these fish um, down, uh, up and down these dams. In addition to that tracking, we also measured dam characteristics on a monthly basis. So things like dam height, width, presence of side channels, um, downstream pool depth and things like that. And we saw that there was quite a bit of variation across the dams. We had dams as tall as 1.15 meters, as depicted here. This is dam five. This was our tallest dam, so that's about 3.7 feet. And we had uh, dams as small as one and a half feet tall. So there was quite a, a lot of variation along the, across the dams, but they were, they were also very dynamic from month to month themselves. We have dams being built, dams blowing out, dams getting taller, things like that. And so when we look at passage data, we saw that despite um, all that variation in dam characters, this fish were able to pass all the dams. So here I have a figure of relative downstream and upstream dam passage um, per dam. And so this is the number of fish that passed divided the number we saw, essentially. And you can see here, interestingly enough, um, dam five, our tallest dam passed the most fish. And this kind of indicates to us that dam height might not be precluding fish passage. Um, and so we want to spend more time uh, at this site, you know, next spring and into the summer when cutthroat are moving a lot due to spawning, um, spend more time looking at these uh, kind of specific characteristics and how they're controlling this variation in passage rates. Um, but again, stay tuned. I have more to share 
um, in, in the coming months and in the coming years. I just got this data in in October and, and hope to spend more time with it uh, as we move on. But I'm gonna move on to my last question here. Do beavers promote brook trout occupancy in headwaters? So brook trout are a non-native uh, trout species here in Montana and throughout the Rocky Mountain West, and they're known to displace our native cutthroat trout. But our current understanding of their occupancy is that they thrive in these low uh, slope, low elevation streams with wide valleys. Um, and then cutthroat are able to persist um, in these headwater refugia, especially our non-hybridized cutthroat populations. However, every now and again, we see brook trout up high overlapping with cutthroat. <clears throat> and there's a, a, a growing concern that beavers might be contributing to that. Beavers create that low slope, wide valley with habitat that brook trout like. And so beavers are thought to be a potential source for brook trout in these headwaters. And so in order to test that hypothesis, I'm gonna run a landscape scale occupancy model for brook trout using known presence and absence data provided by the National Genomic Center and Montana Fish, Wildlife and Parks uh, um, <clears throat> electrofishing database and layer that over these known predictors for brook trout and add beaver to see if where we have those high headwater brook trout populations, are there also beaver there? And hopefully with this information, we'll be able to start to tease apart that persistent hypothesis of beaver potentially being a source and help inform future uh, BDA installation and beaver reintroduction work um, to avoid any potential negatives of these actions. But with that, um, I'm gonna hand it off to Sierra. I wanna thank everyone again for taking the time to come today and um, keep, your, keep your eyes out for future work from us. Get this in the right view. All right. Thanks, you guys. That was really awesome to have everybody sort of put all that together. I want to thank you, Jamie and Andy and Andrew, for um, giving us those highlights today. And um, I just also want to say, you know, it's it's really great to sort of see this all come together because the Nature Conservancy has had a hand in all of these projects working on our landscapes with landowners and people. So it's great to sort of, um, I guess, put it all together. And I wanted to say that there has been a lot of research collaboration across Montana. This is just a small subset of a very wide list, but we've really had an opportunity to work with um, national, different national conservation organizations and different watershed groups, conservation districts, and a lot of different state and federal agencies on these beaver mimicry projects. So if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to Sarah or I um, about that. But I guess on a more personal note, um, Jamie's research that she mentioned about Megan Moore was extremely informative for some of the freshwater work that I do in Southwest Montana and just understanding how we better collaborate with landowners, how we better work with our partners and understand some of the barriers and concerns that they have. So, um, with that, I will move it on to questions. Um, so go ahead and if you want, we can you can unmute yourself or I can unmute you or you can just type a question into the thing and we'll share it with um, the next whoever is the most appropriate. Sorry, I'm trying. Well, I know there was one question while I'm getting my chat pulled back up here from Lily Haynes, and I'm wondering if Andy Bost might want to answer that question. But, um, and Andy, I'm not sure if you saw it in the chat. It was, how do you consider the annual variations in snowpack for your modeling and monitoring? Yeah, so we uh, have the snow tell site at Divide is uh, basically halfway between the two sites that were monitoring and we also have uh, control reaches upstream of each of the treatment reaches. So we have both the, uh, I guess we have the control so we can see if that's climatic variability is causing the changes we're seeing or if that is uh, due to the treatments themselves. Thank you. All right, next question um, is from Steve Carbonato. What about looking at bull trout? This species and BDAs have become a sticking point in several restoration projects that have been proposed to them. Yeah, so that's definitely been a concern that I've heard as well. 
Um, there, I haven't, I'm not personally working on bull, with bull trout um, just because the streams that I'm in don't have them. Uh, but I know there's a group from Utah hoping to work with bull trout and BDAs off of the Bitterroot here soon. They might have started that project this summer. Um, so there are people working on that. All right, thank you. Hey, well, this is Clint Sestrich, and I can provide some insight into that question. So back around 2000, I was involved in a radio telemetry study in the Bitterroot, and we had radio transmitters in a handful of bull trout. I think it was around uh, 12 fish and tracked them through the season and found out that bull trout were able to ascend you know, small streams uh, with beaver dams to access a spawning habitat. And um, with one exception, um, those fish were able to, to move down through those systems as well. I think that becomes a major concern, you know, as late season flows become so low and brook trout or bull trout are moving in the fall just to spawn, um, that's where this concern, you know, becomes an issue and becomes very contextual. You know, some streams go, are able to maintain flows with beaver dams and some aren't. And so I think it's a site by site decision process, but the more we can learn about the specific characters that are controlling brook trout or bull trout pa passage, the, the better. Agreed. And I would just add to it depends on life history and, and timing of movement. So in the Bitterroot, you know, those fish are moving into tributaries on the descending limb of the hydrograph. So early on, rather than moving up in the fall, the spawn is in some other system. So you're, you're right on. Great. If people want to unmute themselves, um, you're able to do that and ask your questions directly to the various speakers. Right, feel free to type them in the chat and I'll share that. So I see a question about measuring dam height. Um, so we, in addition to height and width and things like that, we, me we described quantitatively the major flow path, whether it was over or through or around the dam um, throughout the season as well. So we weren't just measuring those kind of typical, you know, uh, impoundment uh, measurements. And we were also taking pictures regularly. All those pictures were from West Fork Lolo Creek for the most part. Um, this is Sarah Church. I have a question for Jamie. Um, Jamie, I'm wondering about the traditional ranchers. And I know you talked about barriers and motivations and whatnot. But I wondered if you could talk more about I'm just wondering, um, it's ranchers and farmers are motivated um, a lot by their own land and crops and livestock. Um, were, are there, did they see any benefits to this beaver mimicry stuff for their own um, livelihoods and operations? Yeah, thanks, Sarah. That's a great question. And um, Megan Moore is, I, I think I saw that she's on the call. I certainly don't want to put her on the spot since it's been a couple of years since she did the interviews, but she uh, has a much more in-depth understanding um, of, of the interviews that she did. But my sense um, is that generally no, um, that if, if anything, I was just rereading her thesis this morning and that if anything, there um, were concerns maybe about the act actual how it affect practical applications um, on the farm, so, you know, wetter areas, um, ponding, um, that there could be some environmental benefit and, you know, maybe recharge the aquifer. Um, but I, I don't recall. And again, Megan, I don't want to put you on the spot, but feel free to chime in. I don't remember any direct benefit. Um, and and her, her project was couched larger as sort of a drought, um, understanding how ranchers respond to drought, including um, things that could provide natural water storage, both flood irrigation and beaver mimicry. Um, and it, it, it didn't really come up as a direct um, business. Sure, Jamie, I would just agree with what you're saying. Um, hi, Sarah. Hi. And would say that a lot of ranchers, especially traditional ranchers, were they cared about their land, but they saw beaver mimicry. So often we asked about flood irrigation as well. 
um, and were looking at both of those practices, and they saw their land as being often negatively impacted by beaver mimicry because a lot of areas when we would walk around their ranches um, or they would, you know, where the river would be would be a lot of where the hang would happen. So they would be afraid that that would be flooding and actually, you know, detrimentally affecting their livelihoods in that way. Interesting. And then like the natural water storage part wasn't really, um, they didn't see that as a benefit necessarily. I think they did. I think a lot of them that still um, were flood irrigating really saw the benefits of flood irrigation, but often didn't see flood irrigation and beaver mimicry. They couldn't see them together as both providing those benefits. They were really sold. Even people that no longer flood irrigated would tell me, you know, because of different constraints why they couldn't flood irrigate anymore, but said that they really saw those benefits and would keep flood irrigating if they could. Um, but they did not see that kind of on the same plane as beaver mimicry. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for chiming in, Megan. This is Clint Sestrich, and I can add a little perspective from my experience working on the Custer Gallatin National Forest. So in review of some of our range allotments, we've seen that where beavers have been eliminated, we've seen a conversion to upland vegetation and noxious weeds. And, you know, that doesn't translate to very good range productivity for, for growing beef. So I think if there are studies out there that could, you know, demonstrate that increase in uh, productivity and, and plant biomass for producing agric agriculture, that would be great. But, you know, based on my observations, if you can, you know, rewet those floodplains that have converted to upland veg, I think you can increase the productivity. And I think that would be a good incentive for, for ranch managers or ranchers. Great. Um, there's also a question in the chat from Chris Jordan. It says there are a number of a published research studies demonstrating the biological benefit of beaver dam complexity. Um, let's see here. Oh, I'm sorry. The biological benefit, benefit of beaver dam habitat for trout, the temperature and fish passage concerns and relative fish passage, in particular brook trout. Projects are in California, Oregon, and Utah. Where are the knowledge gaps that work in Montana? that with the work in Montana will help fill. Um, and I'm not sure if any of our speakers wanna answer that. I saw that Lisa Evie is also on the call. So if someone wants to jump in and answer that, that'd be great. Sure, uh, this is Lisa, can you hear me? Yeah? Yes. Okay. Um, so I think one of the things that um, at the landscape scale, Andrew's work is doing is looking at um, the trade-offs of the improvement of habitat with beaver for what these isolated West Loop cutthroat populations versus the um, potential expansion of brook trout. So it's uh, not, yes, you know, we do know that brook trout do well in cool habitat and beaver, but it's these specific trade-offs that we've seen um, potentially could go either way with those high elevation populations being in very um, low productive small habitat. So where there aren't brook trout, beaver, are important for their persistence. So it's the trade-off of sort of thinking about the context of conserving these isolated non-hybridized populations, trade-offs of sort of the habitat changes as well as the presence of brook trout. And Does I do want to say, like, we're not completely, oh, sorry, what? Well, I guess what I'm gonna say is that we, we're aware of those projects and I think despite the the presence of those projects happening and being well published and being well received, they are the managers and folks that are still in charge of permitting um, beaver restoration in places like Montana and throughout the Rocky Mountain West still don't have the context they need to make confident decisions um, because California, Oregon, and Utah are so different than what we have going on here as far as climate change and non-native species and the interaction of those with our native populations. And so I'm trying to help kind of bridge the gap between the existing research and the context we have here. Um, a lot of my research designs are mimicking those studies you mentioned so that we can compare directly to them and try to help build out that context for our decision makers. Great, thank you. Um, an additional question just came in the chat. It says, because beaver dams also help floodplain storage 
of sediment and carbon organic matter, does this arise as a benefit for landowners? I'm not sure which he wants to answer that. Um, well, because it's directed, the question I understood to be directed at landowners, I could chime in. And, but basically, I mean, we didn't ask that question specifically. Um, so yeah, it could be really interesting to, to do another set of surveys with a set of um, bene benefits uh, from the literature or, and then see how landowners perceive those. We were really just focused um, on drought and drought responses. Um, and I don't know, unless again, unless Megan wants to chime in, I don't recall um, sediment coming up in the interviews. I had a question for Andrew Bobst, if I can. Sure. Can you hear me okay? Yep, go ahead. <clears throat> Um, I'm just curious on the Alkali Creek site. Uh, I spent quite a bit of time up there when I was working for Fish, Wildlife, and Parks in Region 3. And my understanding is that site on Alkali Creek is an old sediment bed from a reservoir. And I'm wondering if that sort of sedimentation pattern across that meadow might be a lot different than what you would encounter in other low gradient wide valley meadows in like the Western United States and, and how that might impact those results? Well, I think one thing that's uh, quite different there is the fact, well, the other interesting thing about that site is there's a huge landslide complex. And so um, one nice thing about it is that the downstream end of that reservoir, you know, where the dam was built is actually where the landslide came up against it. And so there's very little groundwater outflow, or at least I'd expect there to be very little um, on that downstream end. Uh, the other thing is we have very fine sediments there. And I think that's part of the reason why we're seeing that it takes uh, three or four years for, well, in some physometers, they still haven't stabilized. There's just continuing to creep up year after year, uh, but it's just a very slow response in that site because of the fine grained sediments that we're dealing with. Okay, thank you. So, you, so you would expect maybe that response would even be faster in a, in a more natural context, at least in terms of the sediment within the meadow? Well, it would be faster both ways. So things would fill up faster and they would drain faster. Okay, and, that makes sense, thank and you. And so it takes a little bit to think about, is that a good thing or a bad thing? But. Um, okay. Um, if I can mention one other thing, I just wanted to, in terms of the discussion around uh, fish passage, uh, Kyle Cunning out of Centennial Valley did a really great paper on uh, passage of beaver dams by grayling um, that I think uh, has a lot of relations to this question of brook trout and bull trout. And one of the interesting things they found was that often it was one single major dam that was actually the major barrier versus a series of dams. So that sort of the context of that dam seems to be really, really important, at least for Arctic grayling, but I think that will be something that would be similar to bull trout. I just wanted to get that in there really quick in case people haven't checked out that paper. Thank you. Um, another question that's in the chat, and I, I can't tell if it's been answered because there's quite a lot of questions in the chat. It says, are there studies comparing the benefits of BDAs versus actual beaver dams or a cost benefit analysis of reintroduction? So a lot of the work that's been done with beavers and BDAs and fish has occurred in streams that have natural beaver dams in them as well as BDAs. Um, and so there was some comparison there. So I'm thinking primarily the Bridge Creek work um, out in Oregon. Um, but if like as far as approaching that from a cost benefit analysis and re reintroduction point of view, I think folks I, I haven't seen much of that. Okay, thank you. Um, another question, this is again for you, Andrew. Um, the one and a half flow increase you referenced through your BDA reach is a striking number. I think it is a large increase relative to values that Andy Bopes presented and wonder what your thoughts on uncertainty around your flow values. What were the rough discharge values in the creek to put the one and a half factor in more context? 
So yeah, I, I'm definitely, <clears throat> I wanna reiterate that these are very preliminary results. Um, so I've had about a month to look at them, um, a month to create those, uh, those rating curves and then hydrographs. So as far as the error around them goes, I'm not extremely confident in them 100% yet. I mean, I was confident enough to share that here um, we saw, so flows are really low in these creeks regardless. They're very small headwater streams. Um, and so in 2019, the TP base flows were at like 0 0.001, like 0 0.002 um, CMS, really, really low flows. And then they jumped up to um, 0 0.0026. Um, <clears throat> and then in our North Fork Howard site, they kind of maintain our control site. They maintained higher flows around, you know, 0.1 CMS from year to year. Um, in general, like they both increased from year to year. It was a wetter year in 2020, um, but the TP Creek just increased dramatically from year to year. And that's based on the same rating curve and the same location of the station. Um, so um, again, no, I'm not a hydrologist by profession, but I'm starting to piece it together. And I, I do have, I'm pretty, I'm fairly confident in my, my analysis there that there was an increase, but hold on tight and I'll be able to share um, more as the year goes on and I have more time to work with the data. So Andrew, do you think there was a time dependence on that? Like, I'm just wondering if the stored water came out and at what point it stopped coming out. Uh, if it did, um, but maybe we don't have time for that right now. Yeah, so the the like day of lowest flow from year to year um, didn't really change that much. It was like mid September from in 2019 and 2020, um, but the the magnitude of it was just so much higher in 2020 for TP Creek and hadn't really changed much at all in our control. So. Um, yeah, it, it, it's somewhat promising and it looks the same for the hydrograph. We also had a really big um, rain event midsummer this year that filled up those BDAs, I think, and allowed them to hold on to it where we didn't really have that in the year before. But again, we didn't see that same change in the control. Yeah, it may just be the addition of the storage and the ability for it to fill up. Um, right. Which is kind of what you hope for. Water so. Yeah, yeah, we, we yeah. can't parse apart whether it's surface water or groundwater quite yet. Yeah, and I'm always thinking from the groundwater perspective, so the surface water is important too. And if well, I can- I'm gonna, I'm in, oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead, Jamie. Well, I was just gonna say we can wrap this up, but go ahead, Jamie, if you have another comment. Oh, just one quick comment. It's so fun to see, especially with the different disciplines and what a great chat box going on. So I just wanted to point to, I think in response to Sarah's question about landowner benefits, um, this uh, so, uh, Autumn posted a link to an interesting study in 2018 about increased productivity, uh, vegetation productivity. Uh, I'll definitely give it a read. It looks super interesting. I guess my question, the social scientist in me uh, wonders, so then do landowners see that as a benefit? And I think maybe that's kind of one of the key things, um, especially in this interdisciplinary working is, you know, there can be scientific findings we find, but then, you know, how does that really translate to the on the ground? Um, perspective um, from from the landowner's perspective. So that's a great thing, uh, one to follow up on. And, and thanks everyone for um, sharing information today. Yeah, uh, just to, go ahead, go for it. Okay, just, just related to that, Jamie, uh, we did do NDVI flights uh, before, after the treatments at both the sites, and we see a very clear increase in the vigor of the vegetation following uh, the BDA treatments. So there's no doubt that there's a substantial green up that you get by putting these in place uh, where you raise the groundwater levels up into the root zone. And you, know, you could imagine where it wasn't in the root zone and never got there, it wouldn't make any difference. But so long as the plants can reach the water, bringing those groundwater levels up uh, causes the plants to green right up. Well, great. Thank you, everybody. I really appreciate all the chat and the questions. And I posted um, everyone's email addresses because it sounds like we have a lot of 
additional conversations that we'd love to have, um, which I guess we'll give a little plug. We're thinking if there's interest, we might do a second round of these types of presentations in the spring rough cut series um, because there were, we had probably at least 12 people that we wanted to top to talk. And so we might come up with a new set of speakers. So if you're interested, let us know and we'll put that together. And especially if you have additional follow-up questions. Thank you. And I'm going to turn it back over to Madison. Yeah. Thank you, Sierra. Um, just as a quick note, I posted the link in the chat, but we did record today's seminar. And I'll just say, if you go to montanaioe.org and you navigate to media and then videos, you will be able to find it there. I hope to have it um, uploaded by the end of today. And then just finally, a huge thank you to all of our presenters today. A huge thank you to Sarah and Sierra for all of your help coordinating um, this seminar and a huge thank you to everyone who attended today. Um, and like I said at the beginning, this is our last Rough Cut seminar of the fall semester. Um, so be on the lookout for our spring 2021 schedule coming soon. Uh, so yeah, thank you all.